All right. Well, uh, for the conclusion of the course, I'm asking you to read an abridged version of A Spirit of Trust, uh, consisting just of the introduction and the conclusion. Uh, that's sort of the sandwich bread without the meat uh, of the book or the view without the argument or the connection to Hegel's text. Uh, but I think it really does a good job of uh, articulating the view that I, in the end, attribute to Hegel after we've been uh, on the voyage with him that is uh, the phenomenology. Uh, and the discussion of the preface to the phenomenology that I'll start off with uh, today, not having gotten to it last time, uh, is in that conclusion uh, to uh, uh, to a spirit of trust, uh, which I'm just going to be uh, summarizing, really. Uh, the other thing I want to do today, though, is talk about the relation of the phenomenology to the science of logic, uh, the book that Hegel always saw as his greatest achievement, as the mature expression of uh, his thought, uh, I had always intended that my treatment of the phenomenology would end with a chapter uh, describing the relationship of the view that I attribute to him there uh, to everything that he wrote afterwards, but in particular uh, to the science of logic. But uh, what in the end made it possible, I think, for me to actually finish a spirit of trust was deciding not to do that. Uh, that uh, that chapter didn't need to be in uh, what was already a long enough uh, book, uh, and that it was going to take me you know, a year or two to uh, get an account of that I was satisfied uh, with. Uh, but beginning today, and no doubt um, uh, going over to next time, I do want to talk about that, um, even though, uh, in a certain sense, the only part of uh, uh, the only text of the science of logic that I'll actually talk about is the very end of it. Uh, what you'll see in uh, the handout is just the last seven paragraphs of uh, uh, the science of logic, even though uh, I'll talk about the whole last portion of it, the uh, section on the idea at the very end of the uh, Begriffslogik. Um, so first though, uh, I didn't get to talk about uh, Hegel's preface. Uh, like most prefaces, it was written after uh, the book. He finished the book in October of 1806 and wrote the preface in January of seven. Uh, and by then he knew that all the pieces that he'd been sending out weekly uh, over the summer had actually gotten through Napoleon's lines and arrived at uh, the publisher in Würzburg. Uh, and so none of that had been, had gone missing. And incidentally, it meant he was not gonna be hounded into debtor's prison uh, by the publisher because he was not in a position to uh, pay back the advance uh, he had gotten from it. Uh, so I think it was with great relief that um, uh, he wrote uh, the preface and he'd had occasion to sit back and think, well, what have I accomplished? And sort of where am I going with this? What difference does it make? Uh, it's an absolute disaster as a preface. It's completely unintelligible. Uh, on its own. It should have been the conclusion uh, of the book, not a preface to it. Uh, sort of ever since he wrote it, people have started off trying to read this book by wading through this long preface. Uh, and most people give up uh, at, at that point. I think it, it really is not intelligible uh, uh, on its own. It should be a conclusion. That's why uh, we're talking about it uh, here. 
And uh, if if you look at the um, <clears throat> if you look at these passages, the main claim uh, of the preface, uh, he, he makes early on 17th paragraph, everything turns on grasping and expressing the true, not only as substance, but equally as subject. Uh, at the same time, it's to be observed that substantiality embraces the universal or the immediacy of knowledge itself, as well as that which is being or immediacy for knowledge. Okay, he's saying the sense of substance is has an, has an objective uh, aspect and a subjective aspect, but the overall claim is we need to understand substance as subject. Uh, and as I indicate uh, here on the handout, uh, he makes this very same claim. We have to understand the true, not only as substance, but as subject seven more times in the preface, telling us that this is uh, the, the theme uh, of it. And so this is what uh, uh, we need to unpack in all the rest of uh, uh, what we look at. Uh, I've suggested earlier that uh, he uses the term substance uh, to talk on the one hand about uh, what is uh, recalcitrant to our uh, cognitive and practical efforts uh, on the objective side of the uh, intentional nexus. Uh, but that there's also crucially a use of substance uh, on the side of subjects where it refers to the community. Uh, now he's emphasizing the first uh, uh, of those. It's not so surprising that we should understand community in terms of uh, subjectivity, uh, but uh, uh, it, it is startling that we should understand the, the objective uh, side of this. Uh, that way. Uh, it, if you look at the second of these passages, the living substance, uh, that's the, the community, uh, is being which is in truth subject. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, or what is the same is in truth actual only insofar as it's the movement of positing itself or is the mediation of itself othering with itself. I think we should understand that in terms of the synthesis of uh, recognitive communities, the synthesis of social substance uh, by a process of reciprocal recognition, but that's the fixed end of an analogy. Uh, he wants to claim that uh, the functional role that the notion of an objective recalcitrant object of cognition and theater for our action should be understood in very much the same terms that we understand uh, the community in relation uh, to subject. Uh, and in particular, the, the uh, form of the analogy is it is the movement of positing itself or the mediation of itself othering with itself. So that, that I hope is uh, easy enough to process if we're thinking about uh, the community being synthesized, my community, my recognitive community being uh, a matter of being recognized by everyone I recognize, uh, that's a process in which I become conscious of myself in self-othering, well, in my relation to my recognitive others. Uh, but, but why is that? And in, in what sense is that the model for understanding our relation to uh, objective reality? He, uh, I would say, continues rather than fills in uh, the analogy saying, 
This substance is a subject pure simple negativity and is for this reason the bifurcation of the simple, the doubling which sets up opposition. Well, at this point, I think we can begin to see um, uh, how he wants us to think about uh, substance on the objective side. If we think about the double movement of experience, uh, the two temporal phases of experience, uh, one seen prospectively uh, as the motive of movement or change on the side of the subject, and then the other seen retrospectively, recollectively as the response of the subject, the intervention uh, of the subject. Uh, the first phase, which shows up uh, already in the introduction is the experience of error. Uh, now, after we've been through uh, particularly the reason chapter, we see uh, this phase as a matter of undergoing what he calls the cycle of cognition and action, followed by cognition of the results of action and so on. It is a test operate, test exit cycle of cognition and action, uh, which includes, inevitably includes, uh, he claims, the experience of cognitive error and practical failure. That is, finding ourselves with commitments that are uh, incompatible by our own lights, commitments as to how things are or how they shall be that just turn out not to be right uh, uh, by our own lights. And that normatively obliges us to do something, to engage in a process, uh, to alter our commitments uh, uh, in some way, in some ways, and uh, actually motivates us to do that insofar as uh, we acknowledge the bindingness of uh, our own uh, commitments. And what it motivates us to do uh, to repair that discordance, that simple negativity, that bifurcation, the doubling of uh, opposition here is engage in the second retrospective recollective uh, uh, enterprise, uh, which discerns uh, a guiding norm, uh, discerns uh, uh, a way things turn out all along, always already to have been, uh, the reality uh, that uh, all of our uh, somewhat inadequate uh, commitments were appearances of, but the measure of successful recollection is that we see this governing norm, this represented reality, this substance uh, that is the reality that uh, we were committing ourselves as to how it, it was, um, uh, in our judgments as normatively governing the process in the dual sense of uh, providing the normative standard for assessments of the correctness of our representings of our appearances uh, and as being something that according to the recollective story, uh, we were actually subjunctively sensitive to all along uh, perhaps without uh, at each point realizing that that, that is what was uh, uh, governing uh, the, our changes of views. Uh, only this self-restoring sameness or this reflection in otherness within itself, uh, reflection of the, the otherness within itself, that's the uh, finding ourselves with 
commitments that are incompatible by our own lights. But this self-restoring sameness that gets reconciled in the recollective phase, uh, at the end of that, not an original or immediate unity, but this reflected, recollected unity, that's what he's saying is the true. Uh, and then one of his favorite uh, images, it's the process of its own becoming, the circle that presupposes its end as its goal, having its end also as its beginning, and only being worked out to the end is it actual. So the truth is the identity of what, when we've completed our uh, recollective narrative, uh, shows up as having been there all along as governing this uh, process, but initially in an immediate, uh, unconceptualized, ununderstood form, but which we now see uh, was implicit all along the reality of these appearances. Uh, he's saying the way he wants to talk about truth, uh, it's the coincidence of that, uh, on the one hand, starting point of this two-phase process, and at the other, uh, and in the other sense, equally the end point of it, what gets reconstructed. Uh, recollectively, seeing the sense in which they're identical and yet required this two-phase movement to uh, transform the initially dumb, merely implicit uh, reality that we were talking about into this comprehended uh, fact that we now say is uh, the reality that we um, uh, that we were representing and responding to all along. So uh, seeing the coincidence of the beginning and the ending is a matter of understanding this two-stage, uh, temporally and historically bi-perspectival um, uh, process of experience that has the prospective phase, uh, the collision, the negativity, uh, the unmasking of our appearances, uh, of our commitments as merely the way things appear, merely the way they are for consciousness, not the way they really are. And then the recollective uh, reestablishment of uh, a reality. And here uh, I think of T.S. Eliot in uh, his poem, Little Kidding, uh, we shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all of our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Now, it isn't just a bizarre coincidence that uh, uh, Eliot expresses this so well. He had a PhD in philosophy from Harvard. He was a reader of, uh, uh, of Hegel, uh, but uh, uh, I think he's expressing this sense here. So <clears throat> uh, continuing in these passages, uh, the true is the whole, but the whole is nothing other than the essence consummating itself through its development. Uh, now, remember relatively early on, uh, I suggested translating his notion of essence as the norms. Uh, so the norms, the essence is implicit in the social substance, uh, but that's the difference between essence uh, and norm. Uh, objectivity, the substance that is uh, the recalcitrant barrier to our cognition is the source of friction, what resists stably successful cognition and action, uh, immediacy in the process of becoming, which is the immediate, uh, uh, immediate itself, that's serving as the norm that in this dual normative and alethic modal sense 
governs uh, the process of uh, experience in the cycle of cognition uh, and action. Uh, th that's the norm, the essence consummating itself through its development while becoming uh, explicit uh, to us. And he's identifying this mediation of the immediate, immediacy in the, this mediation, immediacy in the process of becoming, which is the immediate itself. Uh, this is the process of mediating the immediate, putting into conceptual form what uh, is the, the substance, the immediate uh, recalcitrance. And he's here uh, announcing that uh, that's the way he, that he's comfortable talking about that as the I. Uh, that's what sort of personhood is. That's what discursive subjecthood is, is uh, we should think of that, we should identify that with this process, uh, this two-phase temporal process. Uh, I mentioned another way he sometimes talks about this is giving contingency the normative form of necessity. Uh, mediating, mediation, inferential articulation, conceptual articulation, the immediate, uh, but at the end of each of these two phase uh, episodes of experience, uh, what we have is something in conceptual form, uh, intelligible that we have on the one hand, turned the dumb substance into, but in another sense, not made, but found recollection is that distinctive kind of making that is, whose result is the finding of something that it claims was there uh, uh, all along. Okay, so uh, that's how I think these uh, basic claims about the I or becoming in general, uh, the I as pure negativity, uh, and the sense then in which substance has to be understood as subject, as substance has to be understood in terms of uh, the functional role that it plays in this process of making it explicit, of uh, mediating the immediate, of giving contingency the form of necessity. Now, let me stop there and ask uh, for comments or questions uh, on this. Uh, I'm trying to catch him in uh, the somewhat ferocious vocabulary that he's using uh, here in the preface, uh, invoking what we learned over the uh, course of our explorations in the phenomenology. Yes, yeah, Sequoia. Yeah, so I have a question actually about the circularity of this. Um, how, how exactly does Hegel, how exactly do you see Hegel as justifying this kind of identity and circularity when normally circularity is seen to be uh, a negative feature of justificational models, right? Like if we have petitions to principle, we can't find what we have at the end, but Hegel's saying that exactly, it, it's only true if what we have at the end is what we had at the beginning. Yeah. I mean, a short answer is he's defining truth I think in terms of understanding rather than justification. Uh, so the issue of circular justification doesn't really uh, come up. Uh, where justification is at issue is uh, we can think of the process of recollection as a distinctive way of vindicating uh, and so justifying sort of our current view. Uh, we justify our current commitments by uh, 
retrospectively rationally reconstructing them as the product of an expressively projector uh, an expressively progressive trajectory through our sort of stumbling uh, more or less expressively inadequate uh, earlier commitments uh, showing that this you know picking out a trajectory that has the shape of uh, each step gradually revealing explicitly some uh, aspect uh, that is now recollectively visible as having been already implicit in the beginning. Uh, and this is supposed to be true of each uh, step of this, uh, of each episode of experience that has this two-stage uh, structure. And then it's supposed to be true of the sort of whole sequence of them, since each recollection is supposed to recollect not just sort of the last stage, but incorporate that in a story about uh, the earlier ones. So he's thinking of the circle as, you know, in one sense, you don't come right back to the same place that you were before uh, because it's explicit now. Uh, but on the other hand, it's important that there is this identity of the substance of what was implicit, merely on sich in itself, but now is that for consciousness. Uh, and this notion of uh, understanding something is what he um, uh, talks about as the truth. So just if I can uh, ask a question then, um, so that means that for any of these other stages, for instance, consciousness, because we start from consciousness, but don't find it at the end, it's not finding the identity, but what we find at the end would be then the absolute knowing that was implicit at the beginning. If, if we're looking, if we're looking at, at the meta level, uh, absolute knowing is what he's articulating here. That is this constellation of meta concepts that explain what we're doing in our discursive uh, activity. That form of self consciousness is uh, absolute knowing. Yeah, Siddharth? Uh, thank you. Yeah, so uh, this is a somewhat unclear question, perhaps, but just so that we can get more clear, would, would it be possible for you to say a little bit more about how Hegel's theory of personal identity connects with, say, Hume and Locke's seems to be somewhat, I, I'm unable to articulate it, but somehow seems like some kind of combination of the two, but, uh, mm -hmm. but I might be off base there. Yeah. Thank you. I, I don't think uh, there is an issue of personal identity here for him. Uh, he's talking about sort of first personality, normative, discursive subjecthood uh, in an extremely abstract sense where the difference between you and me is neither here nor there. I mean, that's uh, of the essence of the problematic of personal identity in uh, Hume or Locke or uh, in contemporary discussions. And that's really not what he's talking about. He's talking about what is subjectivity? Uh, what is it to be an I? It is to engage in this uh, process. And the differences between one instantiation of that and another uh, are precisely what he's abstracting away from. Uh, so it's sort of discursive activity in general is what he's, um, uh, what he's considering here. So I claim in these uh, terms, we ought to be able to understand this next uh, otherwise dark uh, passage. Already something thought, the content is the property of substance. So substance is what's out there anyway, uh, but uh, it's in conceptual form, it's facts. It's something thinkable 
I'd say. It's something that has conceptual content. That's the, the bimodal, uh, hylomorphic conceptual realism. Existence, Dasein, has no more to be changed into the form of what is in itself an implicit, an sich, but only the implicit, no longer merely something primitive nor lying hidden within existence, but already present as a recollection, erinnerung, turned into the form of what is explicit, of what is objective to self, as for sich signs. Uh, this is as about, about as straightforward uh, uh, an articulation of the view I'm attributing to him as Hegel is capable of, uh, I think. You have to think of this a notion of the ansich, the substance, what things are in themselves, uh, as being at, at the beginning of this process and at the end, both. Uh, it is, uh, as uh, later 19th century uh, philosophers would put it, both the cause of sense and the goal of intellect. Uh, and it's the identity of those two things. The thing we have, according to the recollective story that we get to at the end of the uh, episode of experience, uh, it, it is what was uh, what we were talking about or representing all, of, all along. Uh, it was what our discursive activity was uh, directed at, uh, but it started off implicit and has now become explicit. Uh, the recollection has made what was implicit explicit, has shown what was merely there to be uh, the norm governing appearances of it. Remember this um, idea that Hegel got from Kant that relations of representation are normative relations uh, to be what's represented uh, uh, by a representing is to be what exercises a certain sort of authority over it in the sense of serving as a normative standard uh, of assessments of correctness of what counts as a representing of that just in virtue of being responsible for its correctness to uh, what is playing the role of uh, what's represented by it. So what emerges from the recollection is uh, a norm that's seen as governing uh, the sequence of appearances, reality is the norm, in the dual sense of serving as the normative standard of assessment of correctness of the appearances as appearances of that reality, and also as something that insofar as the um, recollection is living up to its own norms and is successful as a recollection, uh, this, the expressively progressive trajectory through the uh, appearances is exhibiting them as subjunctively sensitive to the features of that reality. That is, if it had been different, the appearances would have been different according to uh, the recollection. The next passages here are uh, an extended discussion of the role of negativity in truth. Uh, it wins its truth only when in utter dismemberment it finds itself. You know, the utter dismemberment is the collision of incompatible uh, commitments. Uh, spirit is this power only by looking the negative in the face and tarrying with it. This tarrying with the negative, worrying about these collisions, uh, recollectively 
uh, you know, being motivated to respond recollectively to repair the discordance of these uh, commitments, the felt incompatibility of them is the magical power that converts it well into being, uh, that converts the incompatibility of our commitments into something that is functionally playing the role of the reality that was talked about uh, all along. Uh, this power, uh, the magical power that converts the negative, the collision of commitments uh, into being, into substance, uh, which we're now thinking of in terms of the functional role in this process, is identical with what we earlier called the subject, which by giving determinateness an existence in its own element, the conceptual, supersedes abstract immediacy, that is the immediacy which barely is, and thus is authentic substance, that being or immediacy whose mediation is not outside of it, but which is this mediation itself. Uh, and actually just after this, uh, uh, quoted here, he says, the disparity which exists in consciousness between the I and the substance, which is its object, is the distinction between them, the negative in general. This is the source of the distinction between, uh, the functional distinction between subjectivity and objectivity, or between the two poles of uh, the intentional nexus. And uh, a little bit further on, experience is the name we give to just this movement uh, in which the immediate, the unexperienced, the abstract, uh, sensuous being or being thought of as merely there becomes alienated from itself and then in giving rise to incompatible commitments and returns to itself from this alienation when we recollectively repair uh, the incompatibility and is only then revealed for the first time in its actuality and truth, just as it then has become a property of consciousness also. So it, it, it's crucial to uh, our understanding of substance that it causes this disparity uh, in our experience, causes us to have commitments, to undertake commitments that are incompatible by our own lights. Uh, the uh, liquid tasted sour, but it turned uh, litmus paper blue. Those are incompatible commitments given my conception of acid, that's the essential, one of the essential functional roles of the notion of substance, of objectivity, of immediacy, is to give rise to that sort of uh, uh, anomaly, uh, that sort of uh, incompatibility of my commitments by my own lights. But then that's recollectively, uh, retrospectively repaired. And we say, oh, that's because uh, it's really only clear liquids that taste sour that turn litmus paper uh, red. Uh, I've altered my conception. I've deepened my understanding of the notion of uh, uh, an acid. I mean, I'm claiming that at this point, you should be able to sort of understand the things he's uh, saying here. Uh, I mean, how's that going? No? I, have a, I have a question. Please. So um, I guess throughout this whole thing, we're sort of getting Hegel's view on the inevitability of uh, us experiencing error and uh, sort of reaching these uh, incompatible commitments. I'm sort of just wondering, uh, is this to Hegel like just an empirical observation that we sort of tend to uh, 
progress into these like contradictory stages or is there's some like some sort of deeper um almost i i guess as a naturalist i want to say mechanistic explanation about uh how these sort of incompatibilities arise good oh uh, he he thinks it's a matter of deep metaphysical necessity that uh every constellation of determinate empirical and practical concepts uh, if we apply them correctly by the norms that articulate those uh, conceptions, we inevitably will find ourselves uh, with cognitive errors and practical failures. We'll, we'll find ourselves with these uh, incompatible commitments. This is his understanding of uh, the role of immediacy of uh, what anyone else would say was the non-conceptual, uh, the, the sense in which it uh, transcends any conceptualization uh, of it, which for Kant following the empiricists, he conceived that as just the inexhaustibility of sensuous immediacy by our conceptualizations of it, that there's always more to say. However many judgments we make about uh, what we're, uh, about the deliverances of sense, there's always more to be said about it. And Hegel instead reconceptualizes that uh, in terms of the instability of any particular set of concepts and judgments. Uh, that any such set will end up contradicting itself, will end up uh, leading us, when we apply them correctly, by uh, uh, apply them correctly according to the norms that uh, we take to govern them, that we find ourselves with commitments that are incompatible according to those same norms. Uh, and, and this is his understanding of... Uh, immediacy of being, of substance, uh, of the objective world in terms of the functional role that it plays in uh, our experience. And I say, thinking of it as a principle of permanent instability rather than of infinite inexhaustibility uh, by a judgment. Uh, so I guess my follow-up question then is, um, so he sort of thinks it to be this deep metaphysical necessity, but it ultimately is contingent on sort of immediacy uh, producing counterexamples to uh, our conceptions. And so in this way, it seems to be still hinging on what, you know, appears like an empirical fact that, you know, as well, we go along. He's definitely making, you know, he's claiming to know from his analysis of what objectivity is and what discursive activity is, that uh, this empirical prediction uh, is correct, that, that this uh, fallibilist uh, prediction is correct, that every uh, set of determinate empirical and practical concepts uh, will uh, be unstable in this way will lead to incompatible commitments. Uh, so that the very notion of uh, a set of such concepts that was adequate to mediate all immediacy uh, is actually unintelligible. That's, that's his claim. But it has this very strong empirical consequence uh, that is uh, underwriting the fallibilist meta induction that uh, you know we've had to modify every theory we've ever had. He's saying, "Yeah, well, that's always going to happen." Uh, now he combines this, and I'll, I'll be complaining about that later, with the view that that's not true at the meta level. That the concepts we use to understand this process, uh, we can get a final completely adequate set of, and that's what he's laying out here. That's what he claims to have arrived at in uh, the phenomenology. 
uh, philosophy in that sense can come to an end, uh, but empirical science can't. So this is what, um, it, it's this line of thought that leads him into this famous um, line of thought that culminates in uh, a definition of uh, truth. Uh, although the negative appears at first as a disparity between the eye and the object, uh, it's just as much a disparity of the substance with itself. Well, it's being substance is giving rise to these incompatible commitments. So what seems to happen outside of it to be an activity directed against it really is its own doing and substance shows itself to be essentially subject. Uh, it's in the business of making these distinctions and then with our help uh, overcoming it, uh, it's self-like or the notion. With this, the phenomenology of spirit is uh, concluded. You know, we can see that recollection takes what seems to merely happen to us, the errors and failures we experience, and turn it into something done by us. Uh, that recollective activity uh, is the essence of the of both the conceptual and uh, both the conceptual mediation and the immediate. Uh, this is the view uh, I called conceptual uh, idealism. And this very disparity, the incompatible commitments, is the process of distinguishing in general an essential moment in knowing. But out of this distinguishing through recollection comes the identity of uh, the substance, the immediacy at the beginning of this process and what recollection makes explicit. This resultant identity is the truth. So disparity as the negative, the self, is directly present in the true as such. To understand what objectivity is, you have to understand it in terms of this process. Uh, so uh, the evanescent, the commitments that we end up having to give up must be regarded as essential, not something cut off from the true, Appearance is the arising and passing away that does not itself arise and pass away. It's the life uh, of truth. And this is the famous passage. Uh, appearance is the arising and passing away that does not itself, sorry, the true is a vast bacchanalian revel with not a soul sober. Yet because each member collapses as soon as he drops out, the revel is just as much transparent and simple repose. People, you'll sometimes see people say, well, there are people who say uh, truth is correspondence. Hegel says it's a vast bacchanalian revel. Uh, well, what he's thinking of here is that the commitments that on the one hand are appearances, but on the other hand are recollectively revealed to be appearances of a reality. Uh, are elbowing each other. They're incompatible with each other. They're colliding with each other. Uh, his, his picture for that is the, the drunks at the party. Uh, but as soon as one appearance is found wanting and drops out, uh, uh, that place at the table is taken by another appearance, which recollect, according to the recollective story, is a somewhat more adequate, uh, expressively adequate uh, appearance of that same reality. Uh, it always has, uh, at the end of each recollective phase of an episode of experience, uh, the shape of our having found out how things actually are and were all along. That's the transparent and simple repose. Uh, and here he's saying, judged in the court of this movement, the single shapes of spirit don't persist any more than determinate thoughts do. So 
what he's recounted in the phenomenology at the meta level goes through the same process. Uh, you know, we saw less adequate uh, categorical conceptions of this process, uh, sense certainty perception uh, uh, on the side of cognition, uh, but still every one of them is a positive and necessary movement. Uh, in the whole of the movement seen as a state of repose, what distinguishes itself therein you know, gives rise to uh, anomalies, incompatibilities, gives itself particular existence, is preserved as something that recollects itself, uh, whose self-knowledge is just as immediately existence, what there really, uh, what there really is. So I'm claiming that at least once we've um, uh, actually read the phenomenology and appreciated what he's saying about uh, discursive activity, uh, we can understand these uh, passages. Uh, the determinateness seems at first to be due entirely to the fact it's related to another, imposed by an alien power, uh, but in fact, we see uh, uh, that's just, this is at 55, the common thought, thinking according to the meta categories of Verstand, uh, but actually uh, we can understand it as uh, a feature of this movement according to the meta categories of uh, Vernunft. Uh, okay. I mean, that's what I want to say about, yeah, yeah Brett. So I, I guess just going off uh, what you said earlier about how um, Hegel's sort of predicting a sort of stabilization of the meta concepts in particular philosophy, I wonder what we're supposed to make of the fact that it seems like he has that sort of order reversed and that science is sort of stabilized in a way that philosophy hasn't um, in terms of sort of theories that are operating at different levels. Well, I hear what you say. I mean, certainly uh, philosophy went on after the phenomenology and the science of logic, uh, the stability of empirical science is a recollective stability, right? It's that uh, we can tell a Whiggish story according to which the world always was the way we now take it to be. And the Cartesian appearance of it and the Newtonian appearance of it and the Einsteinian uh, appearance of it, uh, the appearance of it in uh, the standard model of subatomic particle uh, physics, all of those we can see as uh, increasingly uh, adequate expressions of reality as we now take it to be. Uh, but that process shows no evidence of stopping uh, each recollective story at each point. We say, okay, this is how things are, but we do keep finding these uh, anomalies. Oh, well, it turns out there's also dark matter, there's dark energy, uh, and uh, these troubles at the edges of uh, the standard model. Uh, I don't see the progress of uh, empirical science as in any way contradicting his claim that things would go on like this forever. You can say, well, isn't it converging? Uh, from one point of view, yes, recollectively, it's a criterion of adequacy that the new theory not only makes sense of the old theories, but uh, makes sense of the old technologies. You have to be able to still you know, keep the old machines uh, running. On the other hand, 
you know, it's not hard to see uh, revolutionary conceptual transformations in uh, uh, empirical science. You know, um, Newtonians would have been astonished by general relativity theory reinstituting the notion of efficacy of place that you know had been an Aristotelian idea they thought you know was gone forever. Uh, and uh, similarly with the idea of fields like the Higgs field that never takes a, a zero value anywhere, uh, you know, doesn't and couldn't. It, these are huge conceptual uh, transformations, which we then, you know, recollectively reconcile. Now, as for philosophy, you know, my view is he was wrong about this difference between what happens at the meta level and what happens at the ground level. He was wrong to think that uh, categorical concepts are different from determinate uh, concepts in that there can be a single final, uh, finally expressively adequate set of them. That's as it were his homage to Kant who thought there was just one set of categories and he had them. Uh, Hegel sees there's, uh, many different sets, but he thinks we can recollect them all uh, as culminating in one final set. Um, and he thought at the end of the phenomenology that he had that. Uh, and in the science of logic, he reconceptualizes what's going on there, uh, but retains this idea indeed, further radicalizes the idea of uh, achieving absolute knowing, getting a fully and finally adequate, expressively adequate set of categories and metacategories. Uh, and I think one of the challenges of philosophically appropriating his thought is sort of dividing through by that commitment of his uh, and seeing sort of how much of uh, his thought can we take over uh, without having to, to follow him in that uh, in that regard? And uh, I'll have something to say about that as uh, I turn next to the science of logic. Okay, well, let me talk uh, about this and uh, you know, when I finally get to talk about some passages and that maybe next time rather than this time, it will just be these final seven paragraphs. Uh, but uh, what I made available on, on the website is a selection of things from the end of the book, but uh, uh, from uh, the end of the uh, doctrine of concepts, uh, specifically, uh, the final form of the Begriffs Logique, uh, the idea. Uh, so if you want to read some more, uh, you can look at those. Um, so what is the science of logic? Well, the, the first thing I think to realize is that there's three different senses, three different things you can mean uh, by that. And the first is, well, it's this book uh, that he wrote and rewrote. Uh, the Science of Logic is a book that's divided into three parts. Uh, the Logic of Being, the Seinslogik, the Logic of Essence uh, and Appearance, the Wesenslogik, uh, that includes the progression from, uh, in his German, Sein to Schein, from uh, uh, being to appearance. Uh, and then finally, the Logic of the Concept, the Begriffslogik. Uh, so it's a book with those uh, parts. But he also refers to the science of logic as the result uh, of that, sort of what we've learned, the uh, final structure of fully expressively adequate categories and indeed metacategories. Uh, that final 
meta categorical structure of categories uh, is the science of logic. That's what we're supposed to learn and take away. This is what he makes of uh, the distinction that shows up in the phenomenology uh, as the distinction between categories that have the structure of Verstand and categories that have the structure of Vernunft. Uh, but now he's seeing more metacategorial structures than just those two. And the third sense is uh, the science of logic as a thing you do, uh, as a process that he rehearses in the book, whose, a process whose outcome is the science of logic as a result, uh, that middle second sense, <clears throat> a process that begins with the simplest, crudest structure of categories, that is meta-categorial structure, the idea of how things just immediately brutally, objectively are uh, the notion of being through a metacategorial structure that distinguishes how things actually are from how they merely might be, understanding actuality as embedded in a larger structure of possibility, uh, an alethic modal structure, so distinguishing between essence and accident, uh, but he's seeing that as reflected in the distinction between appearance and reality, appearances mistaking what's merely possible for something that's actual. So he's lining up the distinction between actuality and possibility on the objective side with the distinction between reality and appearance on the subjective side. Uh, and of course that last um, distinction is uh, what gives rise to the, to the experience of error and uh, of failure. Turns out that what you thought was actual was just something that was possible. And getting finally to uh, the conceptual structure that's common to objectivity and subjectivity conceptual structure, begrifflichkeit, uh, this third metacategorial structure is what I called in already in discussing the introduction to the phenomenology, bimodal hylomorphic conceptual realism. Uh, that's the view that in the Begriffslogik, the last third of uh, the book, The Science of Logic, culminates in the idea. So rehearsing that progression uh, is the activity or process that is the science of logic, is recollecting it as a sequence of meta-categorial structures that has an expressively progressive uh, uh, character. Uh, that's what he does in uh, the science of logic. And that in the book, and that's the activity that is engaging in uh, the science of logic. So that rehearsal is a distinctive kind of doing, it's a recollection, uh, and its result is the final distinctively structured, fully and finally expressively adequate constellation, uh, metacategorial structure of fully expressively adequate meta concepts which as a result is the science of logic in the second sense. So in, in order to see what he's added here to uh, what he had in the phenomenology, I think it's worth starting a little bit farther back uh, with Kant. Uh, so, Remember the way I'm thinking about it, one of Kant's axial insights is that besides uh, ordinary empirical 
and practical uh, concepts whose expressive role it is to uh, codify empirical goings on uh, and practical goings on. There's another kind of concept, uh, categorical concepts with quite a different expressive role. Their expressive role is to make explicit essential features of the framework that makes it possible to engage in cognition and action consisting in the application of empirical and practical concepts. Uh, they make explicit essential features of what you're doing in ground level discursive activity. Uh, this is one of the uh, founding ideas of German idealism. That's one of the ideas that uh, the later figures took and ran with. Uh, I mean, another one is uh, the connection Kant forges between the idea of reason and an understanding of positive freedom as the capacity to bind yourself by norms. Uh, but you know, that's another story. It's this categorical uh, innovation uh, that I think we should focus on. And Hegel radicalizes that insight. Uh, of Kant's, that there's another kind of expressive role, another that uh, concepts can play, another kind of concept. Uh, first of all, he considers the possibility of different categorical structures. Uh, there isn't just one set of categories. Um, for Kant, that was what he articulated the set of categories. And second, uh, besides thinking that there can be different sets of categories, uh, Hegel construes them as different meta-categorial constellations of categorical meta-concepts. That is, he thinks of these as different meta-meta concepts, meta-categories. This is turning the crank that Kant turned in distinguishing ground level concepts from categorical meta concepts one more time and distinguishing not just ground level concepts from categorical meta concepts, but also a third higher level of meta categorial meta meta concepts. And third, Hegel sees the possibility of recollectively arranging those different structures, now the meta-categorial structures in an expressive progression in a way modeled on his final understanding of how the contents of ground level empirical and practical concepts are determined. That is this uh, two phase, uh, historically biperspectival structure uh, of uh, a negative phase where we're confronted with anomalies in the application of the concepts we have, followed by a positive retrospective recollective phase in which all is made right temporarily. And it's that latter move, uh, the recollective uh, rational reconstruction, the discerning of an expressively progressive trajectory of meta categories that uh, Hegel rehearses and systematizes in the book, uh, The Science of Logic, ending in what he claims is uh, the final fully adequate meta-categorial structure of categories, uh, the ones we get to under the heading of uh, the idea. So if, if we think in these terms of the progression from the phenomenology to the science of logic, uh, 
Uh, in the phenomenology, Hegel sees that there can be different sets of categorical meta-concepts, different ways of understanding cognition, uh, normative selfhood, and agency in the consciousness, self-consciousness, and reason uh, chapters. Uh, in each of them, he rehearses uh, primitive conceptions, a primitive set of meta-concepts uh, for understanding respectively cognition, normative selfhood, and agency, uh, sees how the how understanding what we're doing using those categories, those meta-concepts, uh, runs into trouble sort of by its own lights, uh, is inadequate to its subject matter, uh, and how that can be recollectively, rationally reconstructed so as to lead on to the next more adequate one. Although just uh, in passing, uh, it's sellers who taught me to think of these categories in terms of Carnapian meta-concepts. Uh, that was what moved sellers uh, uh, to embrace what he called the new way of words. When he thought of what Carnap was doing uh, as uh, offering a new way of understanding Kantian categories as meta-concepts. Uh, in particular, in the early sellers, as concepts in a pragmatic meta-vocabulary, uh, a meta-vocabulary that lets us talk about what you're doing in applying ground-level uh, vocabularies. And I use the phrase categorical meta-concept uh, or meta-vocabulary uh, because I don't presume that all meta-concepts or meta-vocabularies are performing that Kantian categorical function. For instance, I don't think some syntactic uh, meta-concepts do. The concept of a word, for instance, is a, a syntactic meta-concept, but I don't think it's categorical in any way. Concept of sentence is, but it's also not independently a syntactic category, I would say. And second, I use this vocabulary vocabulary that I get from Rorty uh, as a post-Kleinian, post-Wittgensteinian uh, successor notion to uh, talking about theories or languages, uh, where I take Klein and Wittgenstein between them to have shown that uh, the distinction between languages and theories or meanings and beliefs uh, really only makes sense for artificial calculi and that in natural languages, uh, what you believe affects what you mean as much as the other direction. So you should think of theories and languages uh, as two sides of one coin. Uh, vocabulary is the term I'm using for the thing that those are um, sides of. So in the phenomenology, uh, Hegel sees that there can be different sets of categorical meta-concepts and rehearses some of them. And second, rehearses a progression from less expressively adequate constellations of categorical meta-concepts to more expressively adequate ones. And there he's using the terms that he's adapted from Kant of Verstand and Vernunft for uh, the less expressively adequate categorical meta-concepts, the structure of less adequate categorical meta-concepts. That is, uh, the meta-category uh, he calls uh, Verstand and the more expressively adequate structure of categorical meta-concepts he calls that meta-categorial, so meta-meta-conceptual structure, Vernunft. Uh, what the phenomenology is supposed to teach us is to advance from thinking with meta-categories that have the, sorry, thinking with categories that have the structure 
he calls Verstand to thinking with categories uh, that have the structure he calls Vernunft. And that's to say that he's thinking already of Verstand and Vernunft as meta-categorial concepts, as meta-meta concepts, as structures of categorial meta-concepts. Oh. So this amounts to thinking about the meta-categorial concepts that Kant uses, concepts like concept and intuition, uh, which correspond in Hegel to immediacy and mediation, uh, and, and Hegel realizing that there are different ways of understanding those concepts and their relations to one another and to discursive activity. Uh, so he's turned this crank, this Kantian crank one more time and is thinking about ways of understanding meta-categorial concepts like intuition and concept, immediacy and mediation. So for instance, since certainty is trying to do without the concept of mediation, do it all in terms of immediacy, perception is thinking about uh, the relation between immediacy and mediation in a particular way, uh, and so is uh, understanding uh, there. Yeah, Katja. Uh, you're muted, I think. Oops. Are you still muted, Katja? Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, so look, that far, I think Hegel already got in the phenomenology. Uh, in the science of logic, he explicitly thematizes this distinction originally, this just dyadic distinction between Verstand and Vernunft. Uh, he takes that as his explicit topic, this notion of meta-categorial meta-concepts, as meta-meta concepts, meta-categorial meta uh, concepts. Here we get an initially crude metacategorial structure, sein, being, immediacy, and go through a less crude metacategorial, so meta meta conceptual structure, shine, essence, distinguishing necessity and possibility, and so on, to a final potentially adequate metacategorial structure. Uh, the structure of begriff of, of the concept culminating in uh, the notion of an idea. And within each of those three broad kinds of categorial structure, uh, he also finds subkinds that are uh, less and progressively more uh, adequate workings out of that fundamental. Uh, uh, metacategorial structure. So he reconstructs this progression at the third level and ascends into uh, a meta meta conceptual heaven uh, by seeing that the first crudest way to understand you know, what you're doing uh, in uh, applying concepts, the first crude way of assembling categorical meta concepts uh, can recollectively be seen as a stage on the way to uh, the middle Basin's logic uh, version and uh, as a stage on uh, the way to uh, the final adequate uh, begrifflich one. And, and I want to say sort of more about how this goes, but it, a crucial feature that Hegel notices in this is that the expressively progressive trajectory that he's re retrospectively, recollectively uh, rehearsed 
for these meta categories from the crudest structure of categorical meta concepts to the most sophisticated doesn't depend at all on how the world actually is. Uh, it swings completely free of the details of the development of uh, ground level empirical and practical concepts. It would be the same, no matter how the world is. And this is, uh, it's not that it would be the same if there weren't any way the world is, because it's a way of thinking about uh, our engagement with some determinate way the world is and our finding out how it is and acting in that. But it doesn't matter at all how it actually is for the relative expressive progressiveness of these metacategorial structures that he's rehearsing in the science of logic. And here's a way in which he's radicalizing Kant's notion of uh, what we can know a priori, a priori is an adverb, it's describing a way of knowing uh, that similarly, these are things uh, that uh, the categorical concepts are ones that we could grasp no matter what particular course of experience we had. Uh, still, we would be making judgments about them. There would be conditional judgments, there would be uh, apodictic judgments and so on. Uh, so uh, our grasp of those categorical meta concepts in Kant uh, doesn't depend at all on particular judgments, empirical judgments that happen to be true. Well, Hegel is now saying this at the third level of categorical meta concepts, meta meta concepts, that expressively progressive uh, trajectory that he rehearses doesn't depend at all on how the world is. And this is what's behind two ringing phrases uh, in the preface to the second edition of the science of logic. He says that what he's doing there is rehearsing God's thoughts before the creation. Uh, sort of doesn't matter what world God decided to create, uh, this is what a world is. Uh, these are the thoughts he could have before there was any fact about which world uh, he created. That's what he means when he says God's thoughts before the creation. There were no uh, facts in this uh, image yet, uh, but God could still think at this uh, third metacategorial uh, level. And again, uh, he describes it as uh, the process of recollectively assembling these metacategorial meta structures in an expressively progressive uh, trajectory as pure thought thinking itself. And what it's pure of is any particular empirical or practical commitments. It swings free of uh, all of that. Uh, now, <clears throat> I want to claim he gets too far out over his skis in uh, uh, this view. Uh, but the challenge is to try and see what's right about it uh, and what's left if we divide through by uh, the mistakes uh, uh, that are in it. So after the break, what I want to talk about, I want to fill in the view a little bit uh, and talk about where one might uh, take issue with this development. Uh, but I've, I've at least so far uh, described uh, in very general terms how I see the project of 
the science of logic as going beyond radicalizing and being intelligent to Hegel as completing the project that he began in uh, the phenomenology. Uh, it's because I think that he's making mistakes along the way of doing that, uh, that I think it's easier to understand his philosophical contribution uh, by reading the phenomenology than by reading the science uh, of logic. But I'll say some more about that uh, after the break. Uh, why don't we come back at 10 minutes after the hour? Okay, so the main bit of what I was saying that's important for understanding where I'm going with it is that uh, Hegel didn't just have the idea beyond Kant that there wasn't just one set of categories, that was just it at any rate for critters like us, that there could be different sets of categories, uh, different um, constellations of categorial meta concepts, uh, but they're sort of all on a all on a level, as though at you know sometimes these categories are appropriate, sometimes these other categories uh, are appropriate for understanding the use of ground level uh, uh, conceptions, uh, sort of the way on the side of the transcendental aesthetic rather than analytic, we might think, well, okay, so all Kant knew about was Euclidean uh, space, but uh, pretty soon we discovered there could be non-Euclidean space and space-time and so on. There are all these different uh, conceptions. It's not just a conceptual analog of that. There are different alternative sets of uh, categories, uh, but some of them are better. Uh, some constellations of categories are expressively more adequate uh, than others. Some ways of thinking about the relation between immediacy and mediation, his successor of intuition and concept, are better than others, more expressively powerful. Uh, and where uh, in the phenomenology he had uh, rehearsed progressive trajectories through those, he hadn't explicitly thematized uh, and so had not explicitly uh, recollectively rehearsed an expressive trajectory through constellations of, through meta-categorial constellations of concepts, this third, this third level. That's really what's new in uh, the science of logic. Um, now, even in this sort of breathless survey, uh, I'm not going to wave my hands at some of the most important issues that come up in thinking about that uh, progressive recollected trajectory through the meta-categorial, meta-meta concepts. Uh, being essence and uh, concept and their subdivisions. Uh, but I'll mention one of them is uh, he's got at least two overarching ways of thinking uh, about it. And it's a good question what the relationship is between them. And one of them is thinking about it as the progression between uh, thinking about things in terms of immediacy and what things are in themselves. And then at the second level, thinking about what things are in a mediated way or for themselves or for another. Uh, and at the third level, uh, thinking about what things are in and for themselves. Um, or closely connected to that, thinking about them in terms of immediacy, mediation, and then a combination of you know, mediated immediacy in the concept. That's sort of one constellation of uh, now 
meta 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 terms that he uses to talk about this uh, recollection at the third level. But another is, uh, well, being is using categories of particularity. Uh, essence is using categories of universality and uh, the concept is using categories of individuality or singularity. Uh, now, these are not evidently the same. That is the, the particular universal uh, individual and the in itself, for itself, in and for itself. Uh, no doubt these are deeply and interestingly connected. I'm not gonna say anything uh, about that. I will observe that in the real philosophy, uh, in the sequences of lectures he gave on uh, the philosophy of religion, uh, you know what I think is going on in the real philosophy. He knows that the development of concepts about religion uh, have got to develop in the way his categories and meta categories tell us they do, uh, and so he casts about each time he gives this series of lectures. Uh, which he did many times, uh, he casts about for some way to make sense of it recollectively. The, the vast empirical material, and every time he would read some more about Indian religion or uh, whatever, to make sense of it in these terms. And you find him in a very experimental uh, spirit, trying out different ways of doing that. So in one series of the lectures, he says, well, you know, the concepts, religious concepts have developed uh, from an sich sein to things having the structure of for sich sein to having the structure of an and for sich sein. And you know, he tells his story that way. Uh, but then the next time uh, he uses particularity, universality, and individuality, or uh, immediacy, mediation, and mediated immediacy, uh, it seems like he knew there was a way to use these mathematical concepts to make sense of uh, the development of uh, religious, which for him are already meta concepts, um, but didn't know exactly how to do it. And so tried out uh, uh, different things. So anyway, there's all huge issues there and uh, I'm not gonna say anything about that. As a tangential remark uh, in the vicinity, I do believe that readers of Purse have not sufficiently appreciated, explored, and exploited the sense in which he evidently thought of his metaphysical categories of firstness, secondness, and thirdness as successor conceptions to Hegel's being, essence, and concept. Uh, the extent to which Purse was trying with firstness, secondness, and thirdness to express what he took to be right about Hegel's deployment of those meta-categorical, meta-meta concepts in the science of logic. Uh, now, maybe this lacuna, uh, it's not that no one has thought about this, but uh, it, it's a conceptually rich area that is underexplored in my view, uh, is because each of the thinkers is difficult enough in itself uh, that bringing them together may be a recipe for disaster. And in any case, um, it does seem empirically that everybody who's thought really hard about person thirdness has been basically lost forever. That that um, uh, is a metaphysical born from which no man returneth in the Shakespearean uh, uh, terminology. So even though I don't wanna go into these um, uh, details about uh, uh, the science of logic uh, for reasons that'll become clear when I talk about uh, critical appropriations uh, of these where I think you should uh, disagree with him and get off his bus. Um, even though I can see why uh, he thought this was a fascinating place to take uh, this thought. Uh, there is one 
place where looking a little bit more at the fine structure, I think, uh, is enlightening. And that's the final transition in the Begriffslogik from uh, previous stages of uh, meta categories that have the structure of Begriff, of the concept, to the final form of that, the idea. Uh, it's just worth rehearsing a little bit what the transition from earlier stages, earlier categories that have the structure, the conceptual structure already, to those that have the structure of the idea. That is the final transition there. What's the difference between the conceptual, the begriff, and the idea? I see the begriff, he talks about the concept. So, so I think you know, the topic of um, uh, the whole book is the notion of conceptual content. Uh, begriff is when we finally you know, have a notion recognizably of uh, conceptual content. The idea is what happens when that notion of mediation, of uh, things being determinate by standing in relations of material incompatibility, determinate negation to one another, that notion of begrifflichkeit uh, is expanded to include its relation to immediacy. Uh, that's what takes you to the final conception of the idea. It's the analog uh, uh, transposed uh, into Hegel's key of uh, a move in Kantian terminology from thinking about concepts to thinking about concepts together with intuitions. That is thinking about what uh, for Kant are uh, judgments. Oh, and the reason I think this is worth uh, saying something about is that the metacategorial structure that Hegel calls the idea includes the conception of the temporally biperspectival process of determining conceptual contents, incorporating immediacy uh, as a means of further determining the content of uh, ground level uh, conceptual contents. Uh, it incorporates this uh, two phases of each episode of experience going forward, driven normatively by finding oneself with incompatible commitments, the cycle of cognition and action leading to cognitive error and practical failure, followed by uh, retrospectively, recollectively, rationally reconstructing a sequence of actual attitudes, commitments, applications of concepts as governed by norms in the dual deontic alethic sense that the norms both provide standards for assessing the correctness of the actual applications and are what the recollection insofar as it's successful shows those applications to have been subjectively sensitive to. Uh, and the result uh, of such a process of experience in at the end of the science of logic, no less than at the end of the phenomenology, is an understanding of conceptual content as something that has subjective and objective forms. Uh, what I've talked about as the bimodal hylomorphic uh, uh, conception of concepts. Uh, but here uh, we see a twist on that that I think we don't see in uh, the phenomenology. I've uh, uh, suggested conceiving this as hylomorphism uh, as a form content distinction. Uh, there's one conceptual content uh, which can show up either in uh, the form of a fact uh, or in the form of a thinkable, uh, uh, the content of a thought. Uh, when all goes well, my thought doesn't stop anywhere short of the fact that things are thus and so, the Wittgensteinian. Uh, that's hylomorphism as a content form distinction 
one conceptual content, two forms, an objective form articulated by alethic modal relations of determinant negation and consequence, uh, and the other a subjective uh, normative conception of incompatibility and uh, consequential commitment. Uh, but there's another hylomorphic register, uh, and that's hylomorphism as a form matter distinction rather than a form content distinction. Uh, and here, the subjective and the objective uh, contents uh, in the sense of material immediacies are given different kinds of conceptual form. And what I'm talking about here is the notion of the immediate, uh, which uh, Hegel was invoking under the heading of substance in uh, the preface, material immediacies, and here I mean material, this is the matter that's going to have two different forms, are given two different kinds of conceptual form. There's uh, actual being, immediacy is actual being, sort of stubborn facts, the recalcitrant source of friction, of cognitive error and practical failure, of incompatibility. And then there's immediacy as uh, a constellation of our actual commitments, the uh, conceptions we use and the judgments we actually endorse with them, what's actually committed to, what needs to be processed recollectively and found to be normatively uh, governed by uh, the represented immediacy in the first sense. So one of his fundamental ideas, uh, as fundamental as the idea that conceptual contents that are the essentially mediated form of those contents, can be just the same in both cases, the hylomorphism of, of form and content, is that there's a notion of immediacy that's as matter that's common to objective reality and to subjective commitment. Uh, it, it's stubborn actuality uh, is the matter, the immediacy on the objective side and our prior actual commitments are the immediacy, what we inherit, what we always already find ourselves with uh, on the deontic side of our uh, commitments. And those are two sorts of matter, each of which needs to be put into conceptual form, needs to be mediated, and is mediated by the same process of recollection. So the form content hylomorphism, uh, runs in a way opposite in direction to the form matter hylomorphism of two kinds of immediacy and one kind of mediation, uh, conceptualizing of it. Um, and I think Hegel thinks that Kant in some ways ran those two together and in other ways provided the raw materials to keep them apart. Uh, but in Hegel's considered view by the end of uh, the science of logic, you get three levels that are something like matter, content, and form. You've got the particular, the universal, and the individual that is the particular as characterized uh, by the universal. Each of the hylomorphisms, one of them's contrasting form with content, the other form with matter, Hegel's considered view is there's really three things here. Uh, and you know, we can we can think about the uh, individual either in relation to the particular or in relation to uh, uh, the universal. 
Uh, and this is what's at issue uh, in the transition from the begriff to the idee, uh, is thinking about the relation between uh, mediation and immediacy, combining the conceptual with uh, immediacy of these two kinds. Uh, and again, we're to understand the relationship between them in terms of the recollective rationalization uh, uh, process. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to be appealing when I get to trying to read those last seven paragraphs of uh, the science of logic. Uh, but I mean, you can stare at them and try and see if you can catch him uh, addressing these issues in those uh, uh, dark uh, passages. Um, uh, I'll, I'll be appealing to this uh, way in which the three levels that Hegel distinguishes the three logical levels of particularity, universality, and individuality uh, are his way of combining these two hylomorphisms, the hylomorphism of form and content on the one hand and of form and matter uh, on the other. So what I wanna do before uh, trying to catch him saying some of these things and sort of interpreting the dark things he says in those last seven paragraphs in terms of this view uh, is say why I prefer the phenomenology to the science of logic against sort of most of the Hegelian tradition and Hegel himself who says, oh, this is where I, really, where I really figured out what was going on in that uh, early work. It's because I see the science of logic as in important ways taking a wrong turn after the phenomenology, even though I can see why he thought it was progress and why he was excited by it. Uh, but I think there's two important mistakes in it. And so I would want to develop the early ideas from the phenomenology in a different direction. Uh, and I note it's, oh, uh, a potential embarrassment for me that I think similar things about other figures. Uh, I think the development from the early Frege to the later Frege, from the Begriffschrift and the Grundlagen to the Begriffschrift, from worrying about codifying inferences to thinking semantically in terms of truth uh, and uh, reference was a retrograde uh, step in many ways. Uh, I think uh, Michael Dummett's early work uh, contains riches that he did not develop in the later work uh, and ideas that are much more valuable than the ones he did uh, seize on. Uh, in many ways, my reading of Sellers is that uh, he took one of the less interesting paths out of his early uh, insights and made a bad selection of those early insights to develop. Well, I say this is a potential embarrassment for me. Is this a coincidence or is this just the way things look? The man who only has a hammer, the whole world looks like a nail. Oh, uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't think that about everybody. The progression from the early Wittgenstein to the later Wittgenstein, I think was wholly progressive, but I just noticed that uh, I seem to think that the work people do in their 30s and early 40s is better philosophy than they work than the work they do later in their lives. And there are multiple reasons that might be embarrassing for me, particularly if it's just a, a prejudice. But anyway, I, I noticed that without comment. Okay, I want to make two suggestions for critical emendations of uh, this development of, uh, uh, of Hegel's. Uh, 
And the first one, I think we can make without changing much that matters in uh, his view. The second one, I think, requires some real uh, reassessment and readjustment. So the first thought is, uh, we could really tell everything that's important about Hegel's story in the science of logic while withholding endorsement from and so dividing through by his commitment to the claim that the constellation of meta categories he arrives at in and as the result of the science of logic is fully and finally expressively adequate, that it's the ultimate uh, meta categorial structure, uh, the key to understanding uh, the way all concepts work and must work, uh, not just all ground level empirical and practical concepts, but all categorical meta concepts uh, are to be properly understood uh, in the meta categorial terms of the idea, the final form of the begriff. Almost everything I've attributed to him concerning the relations between the three levels, including the expressively progressive uh, uh, recollective rational reconstruction of them, would still make sense and still be defensible if we took it that like ground level empirical and practical concepts, the evolution of categorical meta concepts and meta categorical meta meta concepts was open ended, never ending, and subject in principle to indefinite improvement. And so divided through by Hegel's contrary claim. And that's making that emendation is my first suggestion for a critical reappropriation of Hegel's groundbreaking insight and proudest achievement, uh, I think, namely his conception of recollective rationality, that historically by perspectival account of the process of determining conceptual content and instituting its representational dimension. Uh, that's his categorical insight. And we needn't say that that's final and cannot be improved upon uh, to, to think that uh, uh, improvements on it will still see that as uh, uh, a permanent insight to, to be built on, to be retained in our recollective uh, rational reconstructions. Oh. All the thoughts that I identified as central in articulating his absolute idealism would still be sustainable in this amended context. Remember, I divided his uh, absolute idealism into three concentric uh, commitments, the conceptual realism, that bimodal hylomorphic conceptual realism, uh, objective idealism, the reciprocal sense dependence between uh, categories like facts, facts about uh, the properties of objects and the lawful relations among them on the objective side and talk about uh, asserting or judging, predicating and referring and explaining and inferring uh, uh, on the subjective side and the conceptual idealism that incorporates the insight into the role of recollection in making the very notion of determinateness intelligible, whether on the side of determinate facts uh, or on the side of determinately contentful thoughts. Uh, what we would have to jettison uh, is the conceit of God's thoughts before the creation uh, if his metacategorial structure is in principle improvable upon, if it's not the last one, well, then that wouldn't be God's thoughts. That wouldn't be an appropriate way to uh, 
think about it. But I think that's probably just as well. I think that was a bridge uh, too far uh, on his part. Uh, we'd be giving up something near and dear to Hegel's heart, uh, his conception of the systematicity of philosophical thought and method. Uh, what Paul Frank says um, uh, memorably and appropriately uh, epitomized in the title of his uh, recent book about German idealism, all or nothing at all, uh, as um, uh, a driving insight of uh, German idealism. Uh, yeah, I think that's the part we should we should give up. Um, uh, as I want to conceive things, the recollective process of expressing explicitly what, what we're implicitly doing in engaging in discursive activity is then retrospectively discernible. Uh, the process of improving our conceptual tools, our meta-conceptual tools for doing that uh, doesn't have a natural or necessary stopping place. The grooming and sharpening of those meta-conceptual tools, that too is an infinite process. And uh, we have to give up the notion of absolute knowing as an unimprovable uh, form of self-consciousness. Well, we can still realize it as uh, uh, a qualitative, improvement in our expressive powers that he's given us. But that's not to say that uh, it, it isn't uh, an improvable one. I don't think there's any reason to think that meta-categorial structures, structures of categorial meta-concepts, are drawn from some fixed finite stock, um, which we can then arrange recollectively in uh, uh, a progressive order, uh, the progressive order, yeah, that we can do retrospectively. That insight about conceptual activity at all levels, that goes through. But as we're not required in the case of ground level empirical and practical concepts to think of that as having an end, um, an end point, and indeed as it's important for Hegel to, to realize that it doesn't in the end make sense to think of it as having an end point. I think we can think that at the two meta levels, the meta level and the meta meta level that he's distinguished to. Uh, and you know, in my own sort of non-Hegelian, or anyway, when I'm not officially thinking about Hegel, uh, work in the philosophy of logic, where I think of logical concepts as uh, having the distinctive expressive role of making explicit conceptual relations of incompatibility and consequence, negation and the conditional being uh, prime among them. Uh, I don't think it makes any sense to talk about what the right conditional is. Uh, there's an indefinite number of dimensions along which you can appraise consequences as good, uh, notions of following from uh, or being incompatible with, uh, and different conditionals codify different ones. I don't think there's a definite uh, totality of senses of good implication uh, or of incompatibility of uh, contents. Um, producing and sharpening conceptual uh, meta concepts like that, that's what philosophers do. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to stop to argue for that uh, view, but uh, that's one place where I would get off uh, his bus. But as I say, I think a remarkable uh, amount of what he does, particularly in uh, the phenomenology, but not only there, also of the advance uh, of the further steps that he takes to get to the science of logic, I think a lot of that survives. So that, that it seems to me, is uh, at least potentially a friendly amendment. Uh, 
and has the advantage that uh, where Hegel's actual argument in the science of logic for the finality of um, uh, the metacategorial structure that he ends up with depends on him having codified all possible forms of inference uh, because he takes um, in the Begriffslogik understands conceptual content as inferentially uh, articulated. And in uh, what's an intellectual tour de force, uh, surveys all the forms of the syllogism in terms of his account of the relation between particulars, universals, and individuals, and says, look, this is all of them. And uh, the, meta, the, the test of the metacategorial structure that I've given you is by codifying all of the forms of syllogism, it has codified all possible forms of reasoning. The thing is, we know that's not true. Uh, well, it doesn't codify reasoning with concepts that have multiple iterated quantifiers, alternating uh, existential and universal quantifiers. That's the Frege Purse revolution. Uh, you can't get the whole of mathematics with that. You're cutting yourself off from uh, a whole range of the most sophisticated, but still most important concepts whose uh, inferential roles are not capturable by syllogisms. Uh, well, that's an embarrassment if you uh, think you found the, the whole set, you know, the finally adequate set of meta categories because, and I mean, good reason, if you had, because you've codified all possible forms of inference. If he had, that would be a good reason, but this notion of all possible forms of good reasoning, I don't think that's a definite totality. Uh, I don't think the quantificational revolution is the last one uh, of these and would point to uh, various contemporary type theories as sort of showing that it wasn't. And I'll say parenthetically that um, I take it as a measure of the extent to which anyway, post Fregean 20th century readers of Hegel have failed to take him seriously philosophically that people who would count themselves as Hegelians have not taken this aspect, taken him at his word in uh, this argument in the science of logic and tried to update him in the light of what we know about forms of inference that are not codifiable that way. They have rather held, well, we must be able to make sense of all of this in Hegelian, you know, in the terms Hegel gave us, which you basically can't do. That's a reactionary uh, uh, response. Okay. But I also would uh, offer a second suggestion for a critical emendation that uh, cuts much deeper into uh, Hegel's thought, particularly uh, as we see it in uh, the form in the science of logic as opposed to the phenomenology. Uh, and that is uh, Hegel has this idea that his concepts, his metacategorial concepts, uh, this temporally biperspectival structure uh, of finding yourself within compatibilities. Uh, sort of going forward, and that motivating a second retrospective, recollective, reparative phase, uh, that that, which he argues, is exhaustively expressive 
of the content of ground level concepts also bears that relation to categorical meta concepts and meta categorical meta meta concepts. That uh, the con content of those concepts is exhausted by uh, this use of them. He has a good pragmatist thought here. Uh, that is that uh, we've got to understand content in terms of the norms governing use in a broadly functional way. Uh, this is, by the way, uh, this thought that uh, Phrygian force, the use, particularly the the norms governing the use are, uh, of a vocabulary are explanatorily prior to the conceptual contents expressed by it. Uh, that's a distinctive form of pragmatism that we see already in Kant. Uh, we're to think about what we're doing in synthesizing a constellation of commitments that has the distinctive unit, the, the unity distinctive of apperception, rational unity, where to think about uh, the con conceptual contents in terms of what we're doing in uh, synthesizing such a constellation, the synthetic unity of apperception, by extracting consequences from them, uh, finding reasons for them, and extruding incompatible commitments. This is related to, but it's important to distinguish this kind of pragmatism, semantic pragmatism, from a pragmatism that says that you should explain cognition in terms of agency, explain the cognitive in terms of the practical. Uh, that's a Fichtean uh, pragmatism, uh, stereotypical pragmatism. I'm not saying that's a bad idea, that's a different uh, idea. It's not the core of Kant's uh, thought. It's not the core of Hegel's thought. Uh, but Hegel has this brilliant idea that the use that you should understand content in terms of the use such that content is to be understood functionally in terms of the role that it plays in this use is this by perspective, temporally by perspectival process of experience, finding yourself with incompatible commitments and then retrospectively repairing them recollectively. Now that, that's a brilliant idea, uh, particularly as applied to uh, the use of ground level concepts. Uh, but he insists that that's all there is to the content of categories and metacategories as well. And I think that's wrong. I think it's wrong even on the semantic pragmatist grounds uh, that we should understand content in terms of views because categorical meta concepts are different from ground level concepts in that their function as categorical is to make explicit features of the use of the vocabularies for which they are meta vocabularies. There is no further vocabulary that stands to ground level determinate empirical and practical concepts as those vocabularies stand to categorical meta concepts. They're not about some other vocabulary in the way that on this Solarzian understanding of the Kantian notion of categories, categorical meta vocabularies are about ground level vocabularies. And that means that even if we think that we have to understand the content of the categories and the categorical meta vocabularies entirely in terms of the use of a vocabulary, it needn't be entirely in terms of the use of that vocabulary.
we can also understand them as precisely because they're meta concepts, we can understand them having another dimension to their contents, namely what they say about the use of the other vocabulary, the ground level vocabulary for which they are meta vocabularies. That's still compatible with the pragmat semantic pragmatist principle that you have to understand content in terms of role in uh, practices of using a vocabulary. But where for ground level vocabulary, the only vocabulary whose use is available is that very vocabulary. For meta vocabularies, we also have the vocabulary for which they are meta vocabularies. And that I wanna say makes a decisive difference. We can understand these categorical meta concepts and the meta categorical meta meta concepts uh, by another route, not just how they relate to other categorical meta vocabularies, but also how they relate to what they let us say about uh, the ground level vocabularies. We can go from the use of a base vocabulary to understand the content of the meta vocabulary, rather than just looking at the relations between elements of that meta vocabulary, looking at the use of that. This is not to deny that uh, there still can be collisions in the application of meta concepts that lead to uh, and normatively demand uh, recollective repair of them, it's to say that is not all there is to determine the content uh, of them. And because it's not, we can do things like jump to the end of the book, The Science of Logic, jump to the end of the process of uh, determining the content of metacategorial concepts uh, without rehearsing, uh, without recollecting the process by which they became arose incorporating uh, content from the collisions that actually arose in the application of cruder, less expressively adequate categorical structures. We can just look at what they enable us to say about the use of ground level concepts. That's a bottom up uh, explanation for the use of meta vocabularies. Hegel's idea in the science of logic is to give exclusively top down explanations. We'll look at meta categorical constellations and look at the collisions that arise in the application of them that show that one of them is not yet expressively adequate. And we'll look at what happens when we recollectively rationally reconstruct a progressive trajectory of those and where we end up, uh, he says. And in those terms, we'll understand what an adequate set of categorical meta concepts is. Uh, and so we'll, with final adequacy, understand what we're doing in applying the ground level vocabularies. Uh, that's starting at the third most abstract level, the level of pure thought thinking itself. Uh, and descending from that to the actual application of uh, that met metacategorial structure the, to certify a set of categorical meta concepts, confident that what it lets us say about the use of ground level concepts is everything we'll ever need to say or understand about it. All of that depends on there being nothing to the content of these meta concepts 
accept what they get uh, through this process of experience. And my claim is that there's another crucial source of content to them, precisely because they are meta concepts for another vocabulary, meta vocabularies that enable us to talk about uh, the use of the ground level vocabulary. And, and that means that there's a semantic flow from the use of the ground level vocabulary to the content of the meta concepts that Hegel is simply making nothing of. Oh. And this thought that there's this additional source of content is one that I want to claim his system cannot smoothly or easily uh, accommodate. Oh. And I want to say something about uh, the way in which I think it needs to be uh, amended. Uh, I'll say that next time, uh, I guess. But um, I'll just point out that Kant, who invented categorical meta concepts, thought they worked completely differently from the ground level concepts. He didn't see a commonality uh, in that. Uh, their content was different. They, after all, were a knowable, graspable a priori. Uh, Hegel took his, his brilliant insight into recollective rationality as the method of determining the content, imbuing concepts with determinate concept, uh, content. Uh, he radicalized that and used that to assimilate the contents of categorical meta concepts to ground level concepts and continue to do that for the meta categorical concepts. In saying that that's a mistake, I'm going to Ruch nach Kant. That, that's a Kantian uh, criticism that I'm making of Hegel. Uh, of course, I have a very Hegelian reading of Kant, uh, but when my critical hat is on, uh, this is a Kantian criticism that I'm making of uh, Hegel. Well, uh, that's our time uh, for today. Uh, you could use, usefully spend some time staring at those seven paragraphs, the last paragraphs of the science of logic and see what makes sense to you against the background that I have breathlessly uh, waved my hands at uh, here as an interpretive framework for thinking about it and keep track of what does make sense to you, what is intelligible in those terms and what isn't so that we can talk about that uh, as well. I'll fill in my story uh, about uh, the second critical emendation, the nature of it, the significance of it, and so on. Uh, next time, say something about how things look there, and then be prepared to uh, read a little bit more closely those last uh, seven paragraphs uh, to round out the discussion of uh, the science of logic in the concluding session uh, next time. Okay, see you then.